whoever you choose to work with, I always say this to my clients, we got to be peanut butter and jelly. If we're not peanut butter and jelly, then it's not a good fit. If you don't feel comfortable with your agent, if you don't feel like you can trust them with your finan- you know, financial information, or if you don't feel like they have your best interests in mind, you know, it, it's a good idea to, um, to look into somebody else. My name is Kevin McIntosh, and this is The Closing Table, where we talk to experts about their experience in real estate all across the country. Let's go. Welcome back to The Closing Table. My name is Kevin McIntosh, and today we will be speaking with top producing real estate agent, very, very knowledgeable, Miss Beth Little. How you doing, Beth? You know, as I said before, I'm living the dream. There it is. There it is. The American dream, owning real estate mm-hmm. and property. But we will get into that. But before we even get into the meat and potatoes of things, let's start off with a little icebreaker. I have a game for you, Beth. It's a little game, Beth Little. It's actually called fill in the blank. I have three sentences for you that are all real estate related. I just need you to fill in with uh, whatever information context you feel will actually make this a complete sentence. Sounds good? Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's do it. First sentence, blank makes clients feel more comfortable. Makes clients feel more comfortable. I would say always doing what you say you're going to do. Mm. Always doing point. what you say you're going to do. Because the first way of losing trust with a client is not following through on what you've said or promised. There you go. I like that. Okay. I believe blank would make the real estate industry better. Make it a little bit more challenging to get your real estate license. Mm. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. (laughs) We see where your head is. Lastly, (laughs) equity can also be explained as blank. Let's see. I like to say it's kind of like the value of your stocks going up. You buy Mm. low, eventually those stocks, it's a long game. Buying real estate is always a long game. So are stocks. So sometimes it goes down, a lot of times it dips up, but just like the stock market, if you play the long game, eventually you always end up on top. That's a great explanation. I kind of break it down that same way. That's that's interesting to see us have have that kind of similarity in thoughts when it comes to equity. Well, thank you, Beth, to start off the show with that quick game and icebreaker, kind of get us into your mentality a little bit. Before we actually start to dig into some things and ask you some questions, can you just set the tone for us? First and foremost, can you talk about what got you into real estate briefly? And then just talk about the market that you're currently serving geographically. Yeah, absolutely. So I got started in real estate a little bit over seven years ago. Before I got started in real estate, I was a lead spa therapist, a nationally certified massage therapist, licensed esthetician, worked in the spa industry for, gosh, close to 18 years. So was very successful in that. I I had 90% return retention rate, great long-term clients. Um, I even worked on athletes, but uh, I was getting to the point where, you know, I was getting a purple tunnel in my hands because uh, right. I was so busy working all the time. Um, okay. Like I said, I loved what I did, but I just knew that it wasn't something I could do long term physically. Um, okay. So, like I said, I was very good at what I did there and I worked with people in very uh, sensitive, compromising situations, be it waxing, be it massage. Um, and I made them feel comfortable and to trust me. And so it was those same skills that I had and I just applied them into real estate. And I would probably say having all of that knowledge and people skills and working with people in stressful, challenging, painful Mm -hmm. situations uh, made it an easy transition into real estate. Um, When I knew my hands wouldn't work anymore, I had some clients of mine that were realtors, uh, talked to them, you know, during services about what they did. Um, I had bought and sold my own house. We were in Redford. Uh, We were so underwater, we couldn't move. Finally got to a point where we could move because we wanted to move to Livonia. Um, We had a great agent that helped us buy, sell. Uh, The buyer's agent, I think, for the 
when we sold our house wasn't the best. And I just kept thinking, I'm paying these people this much money. I'm like, I think I can do this better. And that's yeah. exactly what I did. Um, I believe the next <laughs> month I took a week off of work, um, took my 40 hours, passed the test the next week, and bam, I was a realtor. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. See, I feel like that's been a similar story with a lot of real estate agents. They, they've experienced some type of uh, process with, in, in the mortgage process, owning or selling a home, buying or selling a home. Mm -hmm. And then they, it felt like the service was just subpar. Like, I could do this way better than them. And then voila, we have top producing real estate agents like that. Isn't that beautiful? That's just like when I saw yep. Brad do his show on the podcast, I said, I could do that better. And now look at me. <laughs> seriously i hope i don't get fired <laughs> okay all right so um with that being said um you have a certification as a residential specialist what what is this exactly what first and foremost what is that can you explain that yeah that's a that's a good question because you don't see that too often it's a certified residential specialist so i think okay. as i've kind of alluded to when we first had the icebreaker right it's really 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 easy to become a, a real estate agent. So I usually tell people, you know, you got to screen who you're using for your most valuable purchase and sale. Uh, Cause it's really just 40 hours in a C plus and mm -hmm. you too can sell someone's most valuable asset. So I took <laughs> that very seriously in the fact of, I really wanted more education because as you know, mm. when you take the test, it's, yeah. You know, they're basically just coaching you to pass the exam. So you pass the exam and you're just like, yeah, I can sell real estate, but I don't know anything about real estate. So I just sought to get almost every certification that I possibly could because there is no like college for real estate, right? Yeah. So I went and got every designation that I could uh, that first year that I was a realtor um, and I loved it. I met so many people, I learned so many things. Um, you know, I kept all the education, which I still even refer back to, but the certified residential specialist, that's supposed to be like the top, the hardest thing to get. Yeah. So I, because it was the hardest to get, I wanted to get it. So that's what I did. Um, and it probably was about 90 hours. It was a, it was a, it was a lot of work, but um, I enjoyed it because I learned lots of new things. I have access to more advanced education than I want. I take a, I get like a free webinar every couple weeks I get to take. I just, okay. it helps me keep up with my education. I get to network with people all across the country if I want to for referrals. Um, so basically it just, it just helps, keeps me sharp with education. And it's a nice way to, to differentiate myself from somebody else saying, look, I, I tried a little bit harder. I've got a little bit more education. Right. Uh, and it makes me, because I'm always striving to be better. How can I be better at what I do? Because if you don't stop, trying to be better all the time then that's when you stagnate right right no that's a fact that's a fact okay so with that being said I, I have some questions regarding that why don't you think other real estate agents are looking to get this certification or are they and they just not qualify what's going on you know maybe they don't feel like they need it um it's also it's a lot of work you know it's, mm. it's a lot of hours to put in so mm. it's it's a lot of work, it's money, it's time. Maybe some people don't even know about it. Maybe they don't think it's worth it. So it all just depends on what their particular mindset is. Like I said, um, education is important to me and it was a great asset to have. And it's a, it's nice to have along with my name. Um, it's, it's helped me, especially with uh, some of the other um, older realtors who I may network and work with. Uh, when I put in an offer, they see that I'm um, a CRS. And so mm. that makes them more inclined to want to work with me. Really? Oh, I never knew mm -hmm. that. Okay. Okay. So it, you obviously feel like you have a, you got a great return on your investment in that regard. What about your clients? How do your clients benefit from you getting this certification? You know, I don't know if it really, they know about it or if it honestly really matters to them. Mm. To be honest, uh, you know, maybe somebody might search the directory to find me, but I can't say I can say, yes, I've gotten a referral from it or it's actually earned me money. Right. I would say, again, it is for me personally to have that uh, continuous access to education every year. There you go. There you go. That's a real honest response to be on, to be <laughs> quite uh, frank, because uh, I mean, I guess you could also look at it as it's proof of success, um, which in a way you already kind of use that as that, right? You, you use it as I, I have succeeded as a real estate agent. Um, and I've also taken my knowledge to the next level. So, I mean, 
on a on a surface level, will a buyer or a seller really care that you have that? At probably not. No. But ultimately, like I said, I believe it's proof of success. And it, it's still very honest of you to say that you don't think they were really even putting any value to it because on no. the average consumer probably I mean, probably if you wouldn't. think about it, <laughs> the average buyer or seller, I mean, they don't know all my designations unless Precisely. they really want to go ahead and look it up. All they care about is do I seem like I can do the job for them? Do I make them feel comfortable? You know, have I proven that I can give them the results that they're looking for or helping them achieve their, their home buying or selling goals? That's, that yeah. is what is most important to them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Same thing from my perspective. Can you really get mm -hmm. the job? Can you help me find the right house? I don't care. I don't care if you really don't have a license at all. I mean, obviously you do. I'm just jokes. But anyway. <laughs> okay, so you, have, say, you let's, have... Let's hope you do. <laughs> so you have uh you hold other types of certification in, in, in specialties too. You're also a mm -hmm. seniors real estate specialist. This is our first yes. time hearing about this here on the closing table. What oh. is that exactly? I mean, it seems self-explanatory. Let's paint the picture for our audience. Sure. So that's like another designation that I have that's uh, advanced training. Because working with seniors and families of seniors is kind of um, definitely a different world than working, say, with first-time home buyers or millennials or something like that. They have very specific needs. You have mm -hmm. to know how to interact with different generations, be it boomers, people in their 70s and 80s and people in 80s and their 90s. Um, you have to know their mindset. You have to understand um, what are all of the players in the senior care community that I would need to know and understand and interact with. Do, do I know the difference between medical and non-medical in-home care providers? Do I understand reverse mortgages? Do I mm. understand um, how I can guide my senior clients in making sure that their title is clear? Understanding what's the difference between a trust and a will, um, yeah. different uh, ways of dealing with uh, family members who, you know, maybe the senior has passed or maybe the senior has to go into a senior care facility. What are the different kinds of senior care facilities? Mm. Um, can the senior stay in their home maybe a, maybe another year or two and I can help them with a construction company that can come and make their their home more accessible to them? Can I handle a crisis right. situation at the senior falls? Those are all different things that are involved in selling the house uh, that are far beyond just, I'm going to come and take some photos and list the house. And so you have to have right. that knowledge and skills if you're going to build uh, that kind of trust um, with the senior or the senior's family, depending on the situation. And that's the designation helps with that. Mm -hmm. But I would say that that was a jumping off point where when I got that designation, there was another senior real estate specialist in Minnesota um, who was very successful, who I was actually able to connect with. I learned a whole bunch of stuff from him and okay. did some, some training. And then that led me to another path of connecting with some other people in the senior industry. And I just learned more and more. And then that creates referrals, which then, you know, helps uh... my business. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, I, I don't know if you answered this, but what, why, why, why did you choose this very specific niche market within real estate? I mean, was yeah, it, was absolutely. it some, a family member you, you want to get into or to explain the origin? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say through the years of selling real estate, I just kind of noticed that my senior clients were really getting screwed. Um, mm. and you know, you see a lot of, uh, so I'm in Livonia. Okay. And Livonia has a very high senior population. They've usually been in their house 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Um, and Man. that is their, that selling that house or that house is their nest egg. So senior care, when you get older, is very, very expensive, especially if you don't have long-term care insurance. So sometimes the family members may just want to hire a realtor because their commission is cheap. Or maybe they know a family friend and they don't do anything to improve the property. They just take 12 photos on their phone, throw it up on the MLS, and it sits for a long time. And maybe they'll get 30 to 40 cents on the dollar that they could have gotten had I helped them maybe change the carpeting, do some painting, have better photos and do a little staging. And then I could get them $60,000, $70,000 more for the house. Because mm. that is their money that they need in order to pay for their care. And so I just kept seeing that over and over again. And I kind of like, what can I do to help this particular, you know, generation? And then there was things like I noticed 
when I did list a senior's house, I'm like, gosh, I wish I could help them more. Like, how can I be a more full service concierge? So I started learning about the senior industry and having that knowledge and making the connections and being able to refer those vendors. It just makes me feel good. It makes me, that's like my why, why, why do I deal with all the, there you go. excuse the term shit, that I have to deal with every day in real estate? Um, because I know that I'm helping this person have a better quality of life for the rest of their life. Cause I'm going to have to do the same thing for my parents and, yeah. you know, yeah. already getting there. So the mm-hmm. more, the more experience I get with it underneath the belt, the better I can help my seniors and the better it'll help me with my family when I get older, if that makes there you sense. Go. So. No, no, absolutely. No, that makes 100 percent. And I'm glad you brought that perspective here to the closing table, because that's another another angle. I don't think we necessarily discussed here, like the care of senior citizens, either mm-hmm. getting into a home or selling a home that they've probably that's probably been a part of their life for <laughs> decades, you know. So uh, yep. obviously that will require some type of special attention, special care. I mean, from an outside perspective, you would think. A real estate agent just takes care of any and everything. But I can understand with, you know, people of certain needs and and, and, and certain uh, uh, that need certain accommodations, getting someone of a, a special certification like yourself. So look at you doing good for the world. That's beautiful. Trying. Well, I mean, yeah. we have a huge shortage right now, right, of, of homes. And yeah, a yeah, lot of that yeah. homes is because you've got older people who have been in their homes for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, and maybe they, they really should be moving. It should be time to to move on to a senior community where they can finally not have to worry about maintaining a house or costly mm-hmm. repairs or being isolated in their homes. You know, COVID-19 yeah. just was horrid in making, you know, older people even more isolated. So they don't know, or, and they're stuck. They're stuck by their stuff. It's like, I've got all this stuff, you know, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And then they're oh, just yeah. like, I want to move, but they don't know how to get to that next step because of all of the stuff. And it's overwhelming. And when you're overwhelmed, you know, when you get overwhelmed, what do you do? You kind of just shut down, right? You're like, I don't want to yeah. deal with it. That's where hopefully I can come in where I can say, great, I got a plan. Let's make a plan. Um, I've got great professional organizer downsizers that I work with. I'll bring them in for a consult and be like, all right, let's start working on maybe getting her in and working with you a few hours a week to start downsizing. You know, it doesn't have to be right away. It could be like, let's take six months and start downsizing and coming up with a plan. And I noticed, you know, I maybe say, hey, Carol, you've got this list of um, stuff we need to do to start fixing up the house to get it ready. And so if we take it little bits at a time with all of the vendors that I've built relationships with over the years, I can literally like hold the senior's hand and take it all the way to the end. And that's right. kind of the the service that I offer. So there it is. There it is. And somebody's got to do it. So we appreciate you for helping out our senior citizens, Beth. Uh, speaking of downsizing, since you already mentioned it a, a few times. That's I feel like that's part of. The housing cycle. I like to call it a housing cycle. I feel like there's always this cycle, right? You have first time home buyers, they buy a home, they're excited. Mm-hmm. Okay. Maybe it's not their forever home, or maybe it is, but they're in a home. Uh, they eventually have kids, a family. Maybe they need a bigger home. They get a bigger home. Kids get grown, they move out. So now they're looking at possibly downsizing, possibly getting a smaller home. Then, you know, they get a little bit older. Maybe they don't even want a home because they don't want to do maintenance and renovation. So they go to somewhere mm-hmm. like a condo townhouse. That That's what I feel like the, the life cycle of, of home and property is. But you also yeah. spoke on downsizing, which is also part yeah. of that that uh process. And and it, it, it seems kind of crazy. Like, do you ever get into a situation where a client wants to move to maybe even a potentially bigger home? but you have to convince them that maybe it's best that a smaller home could work best for you. You ever deal with that? Sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And I always tell people when we meet together, like this is a journey, right? We're on a, we're on a home buying journey and your opinions on this journey may change as you learn and grow about yourself. And so I usually try to ask what are called like um, calibrated questions. Like, Mm. can you help me understand why a bigger home would be what you're looking for? Can you help me understand like, or have you thought of like, what kind of maintenance would you be open to? Do you have the funds to pay somebody for this maintenance? 
um, you know, where do you see yourself in five years with a, with a house that, that is this size? You know, I, I kind of, again, try to ask open-ended questions to make them think of, is this something that I really, really want? And, so, and then, because I can't tell people, you can't tell people anything. They right. have to come up with that solution themselves. Mm -hmm. So again, I just, we just have conversations and we explore and, you know, a lot of the times they kind of come to the conclusion themselves, which is the way I usually prefer it because then we tend to, I, I help them come to that uh, conclusion, but, you know, they have to come up with it themselves. But I just like to, you know, again, calibrate questions and challenge them mm -hmm. a little bit on why, help me understand why this is something you want. Yeah, man, I, I tell you, downsizing, in the, that's an art, right? I, I imagine because mm -hmm. I hate to move in general. I feel like everybody oh, hates to move. It's but horrible. to move, a, a, after you continue to move, we all know you accumulate so much stuff. And then to yep. go down to a, a, a property, a home that's smaller so that you have to literally like kind of decide, like get rid of stuff or put it in storage or give it away or yeah. sell it. That's a whole literally process. So like downsizing is an art and a science. So that's another mm -hmm. specific niche within real estate. I'm glad we're starting to crack open a little bit in, in some yeah. of the uh, areas that you serve. Man, you serve some very unique areas. Beth. Yeah, I do. And, um, you know, areas where I think that there's a need. So that's why I'm trying to, again, distinguish myself because everybody knows a realtor, right? But mm -hmm. uh as far as like when I'm trying to help people downsize, cause obviously people are very emotionally attached to their things. We get a yeah. lot of emotion. So again, that's why I like to have time with my people to help them emotionally process letting things go. Um, I do find that with older people or sometimes people in general, sometimes you're a little bit more easy to let things go if you know they're going to a good place. So I've got a great like a uh, resource list for donation that I like to give uh, my clients. Like here's okay. all the great, places that uh, you could donate your things to that people could really find useful, um, especially the older generation, you know, that were near the Great Depression. They really hate letting things go. But if you let them know that this is actually going to people that need it, they are a lot more um, mm -hmm. apt to let things go. I know when I get rid of stuff in my house, if I know that it's going to somebody who's actually going to use it, I get a nice warm feeling and I'm able to, to give it oh, away yeah. versus just, oh gosh, this is going into a dumpster. So Again, it's all in how you you help your clients um, understand it. And then I give them the resources for great places for donation. There's also Facebook groups that I'll post things on for my clients uh, once in a while to, you know, people in need could really use this, this dresser or this, you know, bunch of stuff in your, these tools you're not using anymore, this young family could use. And, and it really seems to make a difference when they're letting things go. There it is. There it is. Helping people realize what's really essential and just cut the fat out, ladies and gentlemen. We got too much baggage <laughs> for no reason. Home ownership is a hedge against inflation. This is something that you mentioned. And I think I have a great grasp as to what this means exactly. But can you take the time to explain this to me and our audience as to what do you mean by home ownership is a hedge against inflation? Well, yeah. <laughs> I would say... <laughs> <laughs> that, um, you know, inflation is always going to to go up. And so hopefully your home value will continue to go up with inflation. Uh, and then with inflation, rent prices go up as well. Uh, but when you have a mortgage, obviously, that monthly mortgage payment stays the same. So with inflation going up, your rent prices will go up, everything else will go up, but that monthly mortgage payment will stay the same. So at least you can always bank on, I know what my monthly payment is going to be with a mortgage while everything else is going up. So as inflation goes up, your payment stays the same. Theoretically, you're paying down on that mortgage, whereas as the years go by, you your value goes up, you build more equity in your house, which again, sets you up uh, financially later um, in life, depending on how long you own the property. All right, there it is. There it is. Hey, but there's there's a situation or this scenario that I, I've read about. I want to see if you can kind of help me out with this, right? So um, it was a situation where someone was looking to sell their home. Um, I believe they were looking to downsize, for an example. Let's just say for an example. But uh, they found a home that they wanted to buy. But the current home that they were living in, living in that they wanted to sell just wasn't selling 
fast enough for them to get the money to purchase their new home. Now, I mm -hmm. heard of something called a bridge loan. Does mm -hmm. this help with this type of problem? Can you explain what a bridge loan is and how it can help out in a situation like this? Yeah, absolutely. I actually work with bridge loans a lot. Um, I would say there's only one lender that I found that actually has a true bridge loan that I use. Um, okay. I don't know if I should mention them here or not, but uh, you know, there's, there's other lenders that have a bridge loan, but it's not really a bridge loan. It's kind of like, a, think of it just like an advanced equity line of credit, but the okay. lender that I work with has a true bridge loan. So a true bridge loan means that the bank is going to essentially buy your current home. Uh, and the, the cost is about, at least with this particular lender, like about $1,400. So it's $500 for an appraisal on your current loan and then the lending fees. Uh, you can borrow up to 75% of the equity that you have in your current home. And then you mm. use that for the purchase of your next home. And that offer you can make on your next home is non-contingent on your current home. So you can literally offer on a next home and not have it contingent on that one. Um, you close that bridge loan, you have up to six months to sell that house while you're looking for another house and you don't pay your mortgage payment on the first house. Now, does interest accrue? Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, so it's not like free, free, but right. you don't have to pay up to six months for that house while you're looking for a next one. Um, and that has been with this crazy market, pretty much the only way I've been able to help people. I was buy and sell ask. at the same time. Okay. Uh, otherwise, because nobody's like in the scenario you're talking about. I'm like, I don't know how they got a contingent offer accepted, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that doesn't usually happen uh, right now. But it's my way of, um, you know, being able to to get them into another home, ideally move them into the new home, and then I can get my hands on their home. We can get a cleaned out stage, photograph, and then I usually, you know, get it sold relatively quickly. So there's not too much of a too much of a lag in between the two. So that mm. is the bridge loan program that I work with a lot. Now, as I said, there's other bridge loan programs that other lenders do. It's really just borrowing the equity from your first house, but not really taking that debt to income ratio off the table or not having to pay on both homes. Uh, every bank is a little bit different. This is just the program that I found with this particular lender. And I searched gotcha. for years. Um, mm. so this, this particular one's been a game changer for me. Um, I love it. It works out well. So I think I closed probably about five or six houses last year with it. Okay. Um, and then I've got, I think another one going on right now with it. Okay. Okay. That was kind of going into my follow-up question, uh, pretty much asking, is, is this something that we're seeing become more popular, especially with today's market and how it's fluctuating or is, is it less popular, but it, if I'm not mistaken, you you start you're saying that it is starting to become a little popular. I mean, this is for for me. It's a tool that I use a lot um, right, because right. you know every market's a little bit different. Everybody's very uncertain about things this year. Interest rates is the market going to crash? Gosh, you know, I always tell people if I knew that, then I would be a real estate billionaire and I would not be on this podcast with you for sure. Um, <laughs> but uh, I I I can only tell people what I see, and I'm a right. full time okay. agent. And I work. 40 plus 60 hours a week. And I can tell you that in my particular market in the Livonia, Northville, Novi, Plymouth surrounding areas, if the house is priced well, if it is in good condition and if it's marketed correctly, it is multiple offers still. We still have very mm. low inventory. So with that being said, if I've got people that want to, you know, change places, buy, sell, you know, at the same time, I'm not getting my contingent offers accepted. So we got to right. do something. So I, the bridge loan is the way to make a non-contingent offer. They've usually acquired a large amount of equity um, since price values have gone up very much so in the past two or three years. Correct. And that is the way I've been helping people um, get into that next house. Because if we tried to, say, put their house on the market, we get an offer, and then we go shopping, now we have to settle for something because we have to get into a house, right? Yeah. yeah. So we, with the, the bridge loan option that I have, we're able to shop around for a house that we like and not have to settle, then we go and sell. So until we have a large amount of inventory where I don't have to do that, um, then um, that's kind of what I've been doing right now. 
Mm, definitely makes sense now. Okay, that makes sense. I'm glad you painted that picture for it. It, it would make sense that would be a solution in times like this with the market. On your on your social media pages, you post the differences of a home that is staged versus a home that is <laughs> not staged. And for our audience listening, staging is essentially, and you correct me if I'm wrong, please, it's essentially <laughs> when you are featuring furniture and different uh, types of, um, I don't know, uh, decorations into a space or into a home to make it look more complete, to basically make a house look like a home. So this is my question in regards to that. Is it more beneficial for a seller to use tangible physical product products or, uh, or furniture for their staging? Or is it better to use the virtual staging application when selling the home? Sure. So great question. So everybody sells their houses differently. I always use physical furniture. Uh, oh. So when I list a home, staging is usually, depending on the price point of the house and the condition of the house, usually included. So uh, I have like a, a basement full of my own staging stuff. So I'll do light staging uh, if I need it, or if I feel that the property needs more heavy staging, then I'll hire a stager. Uh, and that's all part of, mm. you know, the commission, but people buy houses or actually in general, make all of their life decisions based on emotion. So mm. they want yeah. that house to make them feel a certain way. Yeah. So I make that house make them feel a certain way. So if I take an empty condo where there's white walls and gray floors and buyers are clicking through online on something and nothing is catching their eye, it's not giving them an emotional feeling. It's not making me think, oh my gosh, I could see myself in that property. Right. And that is what staging does. Most of the time, people don't really have vision. So they can't see their furniture in there. They can't see themselves in it. So you have to help them see it through staging. Every property that I stage, I get more money for, and I get compliments from buyers all the time and how much they love it. So hiring, you know, getting it all staged, hiring window still to do the great photos for the marketing that I do makes all the difference when I am marketing and listing a house. As I tell all my sellers, look, you could put a FISBO sign out in the front yard and probably find a buyer. Like my job is to sell your house to the mm. largest amount of buyers that I can. And it's like a sieve, right? So we're sieving out all the people and then the good buyers qualify down and then we'll sieve them down to the best buyers. And then the goal is to get as many offers as we can. So we get the best price and terms. And we do that by staging, photographing, making sure the house is in good condition. So there you go. I like, I like how I feel like you just made a subtle difference between finding a buyer and selling a home. Cause I feel mm -hmm. just, just off of that context, I feel like there's a major difference there. Yes. And are you, mm -hmm. are you here telling me that in those posts that I saw on your social media page, that that is actual furniture? That's not virtual. No, that is actual furniture. I do not do virtual staging. Oh, well you did a fantastic job. I, well, I imagine myself sitting on that couch. That was good. <laughs> that's right. Wow. And, and I just knew that was that, virtual. That's crazy. That physical is important is because mm -hmm. photos are great, right? But buyers still need to feel that when they go into the property. They need right. to see it. So mm, they need to good point. you know, have that feeling when they go in. Um, plus, you know, buyers want to brag about the house that they're going to buy, right? Like, look yeah, at, yeah. I'm going to send it to all my relatives. Look at all these photos of the house yeah. I'm going to buy. Like, they want to <laughs> they want to brag. And so it's that's why good marketing is important. Good point, good point. You 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 talk about a lot of great tips and stuff for homeowners. Also, this is something that a lot of people probably overlook. Gutters. Oh, you went my, into great detail. Thing, yes. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I saw that. I'm gonna give you this space to talk. You talked about in, in great length about gutters. Can we talk? Can you explain? Uh, uh, the damage, the type of damage that uh, so not treating damage. your gutters can do and, and just talk about how often you should maintain. Please go into your spiel. Yeah, so it's funny. Like if you talk to any of my past buyer clients, they'll, <laughs> you know, I've got them all sold on gutters. So like we look at everybody's gutters now. I'm like, yeah. Because <laughs> like 95% of basement problems are completely avoidable by grading in gutters. Mm. completely so easy to prevent damage 
And then I could have a whole nother thing on sump pumps and how to maintain them. And it's not that hard and you really should, but uh, gutters. So gutter, you have to have water away from the property. Water goes down and water, you know, for some reason, people just don't seem to understand why is there water in my basement? Because there's gravity and water goes down and it has to go somewhere. And it's literally a hole right. in the ground, people. Yeah. It's a hole in the ground, okay? <laughs> and it's cement and cement is porous. And so, you know, water will get in there. So we have to give mm. it away. And um, so science, it's crazy yeah. how that works. <laughs> so I usually tell people, you know, you got to clean your gutters at least twice a year. You can get okay. gut or people think they get gutter guards and they're like, I never have to clean my gutters again. I'm like, sorry, friend. There's stuff that goes on top of the gutter guards. You got to get the blower out. You got to hire the neighbor boy to get up on the ladder. Really? You got to get out and you got to extend, extend your gutters. Um, or okay. um, like I see this with new construction. New construction, you can absolutely ruin your new construction by not burying your gutters because you've got this opportunity where there's, um, it's all dirt. They haven't laid the, the dirt yet, right? And mm -hmm. so the builders will just put this short little gutter here. And then over time, the water will just completely erode around your, your new house and it will go down. So take this opportunity, hire a landscaper, have them put a PVC pipe down six to eight feet in your yard and a pop-up so that the water can get far, far away from your house. So the, mm. the farther away you can get it, the better it is for, um, for your house. And I always suggest burying the gutters if you can pay a landscaper to do that too, but always needs to be cleaned and maintained. Cause I can't tell you how many times I've seen the gutter end just right at the corner of the house. Yeah. And it's like, I don't know why that there's water yeah. in my basement because the water is going straight down into your basement. And yeah. now you've got to pay somebody $10,000 uh, to fix the damage in your basement, or you've scared off a buyer because now they're seeing water in the basement. And it's, right. it's something that's just so easily avoidable with basic oh maintenance, God. but nobody teaches you that. Nobody teaches yeah. you how to take care of a house, right? Yeah. So uh, that's why I always like when we walk through a house with my buyers, I'm like, you have to do this, you have to do this. And then I have everybody on a homeowner email mm. um, that gets twice a month. And I'm like, here's your list of things to do this month. These are things you should be doing. And then I'm your realtor for life. So like, use me as a resource. You don't want to clean your gutters. Cool. I got a number of a guy who will clean your gutters. For there you. you go. Like we either have time or money. What do you want? I can yeah, yeah. <laughs> recommend you somebody to do these things for you if you don't want to do it, but it's going to cost you money in the end either way. If you do nothing. I think you just got me too, Beth. I think at this point, I feel like I'm going to start looking at gutters way different now. Now that we had That's this conversation, right. I'm looking to the home that I'm in now and all the other homes. And I'm I'm starting to realize, I don't know if it's the home I'm at now or a previous home, but I remember the water, like when it rained, it was literally, I, I don't know if it was like blocked or clogged, but it would the water would just, there's a big pile of water right there at the corner of my home. Right there at the yep, corner of my home. And that's home. going straight down into your basement. Straight in our down. basement. And yep. It, so it's gotta go away. It makes so much sense, but it's like, wow, it, you you just have to know these things. This is like when they tell you not to flush the the the, the wipes because mm -hmm. it'll mess up oh, your, yeah. your septic tank whole, also. That, that you could see? be a whole nother whole nother <laughs> podcast I could talk about exactly. how to easily <laughs> avoid all of that and just get a backup sump pump for your sump mm. pump and to, you know, people just like are shocked. My sump pump failed. Well, the pump is, is a motor and it, and it does die. So you do have to replace it every five to six years. And people are like, mm. Mind blown. See? See? Um, or if there's clay in your soil, you got to watch your sump pump there too. And you have to get your sewer lines cleaned, you know, once a year and all of these things that nobody teaches you how to do to keep water that is a out of your basement. So, um, and these are things I, I drill into my, my clients had so that we don't have issues later. So. Well, you got us hooked now too, Beth. I feel like we should all be like gutter experts at this point, us and our audience. Well, we appreciate you for coming, pulling up a chair and sitting down with us here at the closing table, Beth. Before we get out of here, if you have any last words and or want to tell the people how they can reach out to you, please do so now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yes. Any last words is whoever you choose to work with. I always say this to my clients. We got to be peanut butter and jelly. If we're not peanut butter and jelly, then it's not a good fit. If you don't feel comfortable with your agent, if you don't feel like you can trust them with your finance, you know, financial information, 
or if you don't feel like they have your best interests in mind, you know, it, it's a good idea to, um, to look into somebody else. So, and you can reach me by going to my website, which is bethlittlehomes.com. And I am here and happy to provide any education and resources that anybody needs. There it is. There it is. And for our audience, if it's anything we took away from this episode from Beth, it's get your mind in the gutter. You like? I just <laughs> That's came right. up get with that. Get your mind in the gutter <laughs> and clean it out. It's, it's right. so, when the weather gets better. But if you're older, don't get on the ladder. Hire somebody because we don't want you to. Oh, fall. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Safety first. Safety first. We appreciate you, Beth. Thanks for coming. And for our YouTube audience watching right now, if you got to this point in the episode, you got to hit that like button. It looks just like this with the thumb up. Also, make sure you hit the share button and subscribe to our channel. And if you are listening on Apple, Spotify, or any other podcast platforms, please do the same. Give us a like, a five-star rating, and subscribe to our channel for our latest content. Beth, before we get out of here, I'll leave our audience with a question for them to ponder on. Hey, audience, how much of an impact, if at all, did your parents or guardians' home ownership have on your decision to purchase or seek a home? I know, right? Think about it. Leave your comments below. Besides that, we'll talk to you later. Thank you, Beth.